the Dreamland Theatre in Edmonton, Alberta. A shabby little building out to make a buck. They worked hard in the Dreamland, but they didn't have too much to show for it at the end of the day. The afternoon of July 21st, 1896. A thousand seats have been set up in the West End Park in Ottawa. When darkness falls, history of sorts will be made here. The Holland Brothers of Ottawa, who among other things acted as agents for Mr. Thomas Edison, had decided to try out Mr. Edison's new vitascope device, which projected moving pictures onto a screen. The Holland Brothers were not too optimistic but by 8 p.m. the seats were filled. The show opened with Belsaz the Magician, who performed some other tricks, and then introduced the movies to Canada. They proved to be an unexpected hit. This was the feature of the evening, a movie called The Kiss, shown here in its entirety. While the movies were just a part of a vaudeville show, but it soon became evident that you didn't need live entertainment. People would pay money just to see movies. So a barber shop in Calgary became the Palace Theatre. A dry goods store in Edmonton became the Bijou. See, when movies started, they were started. People took little stores and they converted them. In the early days, they even, uh, the theater owner didn't have enough money for seats and he would borrow the seats from the undertaker down the road, down the street. And if there was a funeral, he was out of luck. He couldn't operate. The early movies consisted mostly of scenery. Billy Bitzer, who went on to shoot Birth of a Nation, filmed the Fraser River Valley in 1899. The movie consisted of one shot taken from the front of a train. Royalty was another favorite subject. The Prince of Wales' visit to Quebec in 1903 played in theatres all over the world. A Toronto portrait photographer, George Scott, bought a movie camera and filmed one of the first on-the-spot newsreels the Toronto Fire of 1904. Canadian companies sensed very early the potential of film. In 1902, the CPR hired this British company to make movies which would reassure potential immigrants that Canada indeed existed. They were under strict instruction to avoid any shots of ice or snow but they obviously ignored this directive and made the Canadian winter seem like so much fun that the CPR decided to advertise it. This is the first hockey game ever filmed, a feature of the Montreal Winter Carnival of 1903. This is the old Toot Blue Snowshoe Club of Montreal working up a thirst for the tavern on the other side of the mountain. The man being tossed in the air is the cameraman, Joseph Rosenthal. He was typical of the early Canadian filmmakers. They were either British or American, 
and came to Canada on assignment. The Great Northern and Grand Trunk Railways, seeing that the CPR had a good thing going, began to make movies for themselves. When Ernest Wimette of Montreal filmed his children in 1908, Canada had its first home movie. Mr. Wimette, with his general manager, Fred Howarth, was the first Canadian to construct a building expressly for the movies. His first Wimettoscope went up in 1903, and by 1906, business was good enough for a larger theater. The second Wimettoscope became Canada's first motion picture palace. With Edwin S. Porter's Great Train Robbery, made in 1903, the story film came into being, and the audience was no longer satisfied with the simple travelogue. The CPR continued to display a sophisticated understanding of the power of the new medium. The railway hired the Edison Stock Company of New York to make 10-minute dramatic films that would promote the glories of the Canadian West. Young Howard pleads for the hand of his beloved Mildred, but Howard is not well fixed financially. Mildred's father throws him out and Howard heads west by CPR. He prospers in Saskatchewan. He meets a young widow on the broad main street of a new western town. But he continues to write to his beloved Mildred, little realizing that her father is intercepting his letters of love. The widow, in the meantime, forces her attentions on Howard over an irrigation ditch. But irrigation ditch or no irrigation ditch, Howard's heart is still in Montreal. Back in Montreal, Mildred reads a false report planted in the newspaper by her scheming father to the effect that Howard is about to be married to the widow. The father strikes before her tears are dry, ushering in a well-heeled suitor for his daughter's hand. Back in Saskatchewan, the selfless widow, now knowing of Howard's love for Mildred, gives up her designs on him and rushes east by CPR, carrying to Mildred the truth and a one-way CPR ticket to the Golden West. The Edison Company crossed the country on a special train, stopping off along the way to turn out 13 one-reel dramatic shorts. Miss Bennett of Toronto, a professional singer, records on an Edison phonograph. In British Columbia, a rough-hewn lumberjack is trying to decide how to spend all his money. The boys at the camp appreciate the phonograph. The lumberjack realizes the voice he is hearing is the voice of his childhood sweetheart, a fact which is made clear by this early example of the split screen and the flashback. 
Miss Bennett, in the meantime, receives a letter from a friend extolling the glories of the Canadian West. Arriving by CPR, it will not be long before she is reunited with her beloved lumberjack, who will soon become an immensely wealthy BC timber baron. At about the same time, American companies such as Calum and Biograph were using the exotic Canadian bush as settings for straight commercial dramas that were not designed to push immigration. The villains were generally sex-crazed French-Canadian coureurs de bois. This film was directed by D.W. Griffith, who went on to better things. Most of the stories were American, and there was a growing resentment against them. In 1913, the Canadian Bioscope Company was set up in Halifax to shoot the first Canadian feature-length film, based on the Evangeline legend. The film made a lot of money, but all that remains of it are these few still photographs. Then it was 1914, and Canada was at war. Canadian cameramen were shooting newsreels and propaganda films to support the imperial war effort. The Americans were not yet in the war, and anti-American sentiment was running high. Film censorship was born, and the first things censored in Canada were scenes which featured the American flag. Canadian recruiting films were welcomed by theaters and governments until the troops actually went over to fight. By 1916, the Canadian Department of the Militia was demanding that newsreel footage from the Western Front be suppressed for fear it might discourage recruiting. Canadian nationalism was also being utilized by feature film producers. Movie studios were built during the war. The biggest was this one in Trenton, Ontario, the first attempt at a Hollywood of the North. Three features were shot, the last one being The Great Shadow, made in 1919, starring Tyrone Power Sr. It was secretly sponsored by Canadian Pacific and capitalized on the almost pathological fear of communism prevalent at the time. CPR employees were marched off to see it at their lunch hour but despite this captive audience, the studio folded. Then into this somewhat moribund scene came a blockbuster in the shape of 10% Ernie Shipman. He was born in Hull, Quebec, and he came back to Canada after a vigorous career in New York as a vaudeville promoter and all-round hustler. Ernie Shipman thought big, and he was gonna put Canada in the movies. He brought to the task the flair of a great showman. To star in his first film, he brought one of his five wives, the beautiful and talented actress, Nell Shipman, from Victoria, BC. Nell rewrote a James Oliver Kerwood story while Ernie hustled some Calgary money for financing and handled the publicity. Back to God's Country was as close to a sensation as Canada would see. Nell, as the nature girl, is friendly with bears and beavers. The villain comes upon her and lusts after her body. 
play this scene in a skin-tight leotard, but the leotard was wrinkled, so Nell threw it away and gave Canada its first skin flick. The villain, disguised as a Mountie, asks Nell's father for shelter and settles in for a little rape. The villain's sidekick gets his sidekicks. Nell's father hears his daughter's screams. The father accidentally kills the sidekick. The villain sees an opportunity to lose the old man. Nell dives to safety, but eight reels later, she is still being pursued by the villain. Only these winter scenes were shot in Canada. The male romantic lead had to be replaced when he caught pneumonia and died in an Edmonton hospital. The rest of the film was shot in California. The real hero of the film, at any rate, was a dog. Back to God's Country returned 300% on its investment, and Ernie Shipman was very much in business. Next, he headed to Winnipeg to visit the Reverend Charles Gordon, who, writing under the name of Ralph Connor, was Canada's most popular novelist. Shipman had bought up some Connor stories and proceeded to produce six more feature films in the next four years. These films were all shot entirely in Canada, many of them directed by Henry McRae, a former RCMP constable who had made it in Hollywood as a director of serials. Shipman set up separate companies in different Canadian cities for each film. The money was raised locally, and after each film was finished, Shipman would move on before the auditors arrived. Into Ottawa in 1923 came the Shipman entourage. The new leading lady was Pauline Garand, and the new movie would be The Man from Glengarry. Sets were built in the Central Canada Exhibition Grounds at Lansdowne Park, and the exteriors were shot in Ottawa and up the river at Mattawa. Man from Glengarry was a melodrama centered around two rival lumber gangs and the love life of an embattled heroine. The newly built Chateau Laurier Hotel was used for the opulent ballroom sequences and the bright young things of Ottawa were thrilled to work for a day or two as a bit player, thus saving Ernie Shipman a little money. Like most of Shipman's films, The Man from Glengarry did reasonably well at the box office. But he came to grief shortly thereafter with a movie called Blue Water, shot in St. John, New Brunswick, and introducing Norma Shearer of Montreal. The picture foundered in mid-production 
and Ernie Shipman quietly left town one night, leaving a few unpaid bills. He finished his movie in Florida, but it was a flop, and he was not seen again in Canada. Canada's most successful movie producer had used each organ of his body to its fullest extent. His liver was the first to go, and he was soon dead. The Canadian feature film industry virtually ceased to exist. Madeleine de Vercher, the only silent feature film made by a Quebec company, got little or no distribution, and nothing remains of it but these few still pictures. In Calgary, an aging Hollywood Western star, Neil Hart, slapped together a local company and filmed His Destiny in 1926. It was a hit in Calgary, but nowhere else and the American promoters made off with the few dollars that it did take in. Films with Canadian themes were being done in Hollywood with Hollywood companies. King Vidor shot the Ralph Connor story Sky Pilot in California and Idaho with Colleen Moore as the little crippled girl. Canadian, a Hollywood production starring Thomas Mann, was shot on location in Alberta. It was an honest effort to depict the hardships of the Western Canadian homesteader. It is ironic that this well-made film raised the hackles of the Prime Minister of Canada, William Lyon Mackenzie King. As Mr. King plodded through the snows of Ottawa, he brooded on the fact that a film called The Canadian was filled with foul weather and economic disaster. He asked that the title be changed to The Pioneer Canadian, presumably on the grounds that such things may have happened in the old days, but they certainly didn't happen anymore. Another politician was making a more positive contribution to the cinema. He was W. W. Hearst, Premier of Ontario. Back in 1917, Mr. Hearst had established one of the first government film agencies in the world, the Ontario Government Motion Picture Bureau. This was one of their first films, and their subsequent efforts were in the same vein. The product was aimed largely at the education and enlightenment of the Ontario farmer. The Bureau soon expanded and took over the bankrupt Trenton Studios. In the meantime, the federal government in Ottawa had also set up a motion picture bureau. It was aimed at encouraging tourism and attracting industry. The tree was heavily featured in early Canadian documentaries, and the Canadian cameraman became the world's leading expert on the photographing of wood and wood products. <laughs> 
Another Canadian specialty of the 20s was the nature film. Canadian cameramen went to great lengths to properly capture the wildlife of the Dominion. Another art form of the silent cinema was the writing of cute little title cards to brighten up the films. Perhaps the best of the nature cameraman was the intrepid Bill Oliver of Calgary, who did most of his work for the National Parks Department. Oliver would do almost anything to get his shot. Scaling cliffs, building towers, or digging pits in the path of a herd of buffalo. Oliver did much to make the Canadian naturalist Grey Owl internationally famous. His movies on the English beaver expert who posed as an Indian were seen all over the world. Perhaps the most famous Canadian movie star of the silent era was an authentic Eskimo called Nanook. In 1921, Robert Flaherty created the documentary classic Nanook of the North, which is still screened somewhere in the world almost every day. The American Douglas Burden brought an anthropologist from New York to guard the authenticity of another film. Silent Enemy, shot with the Ojibwe Indians around Tomogamy in Northern Ontario, was made with meticulous attention to authentic detail. Using no professional actors, it told the story of a tribal drama. Although it may have been the best film on Indian life ever made, it had no stars, and hardly anybody has ever seen it. In 1927, the Trenton Studios once again became the focus of the Canadian film industry with the formation of Canadian International Films. Premier Howard Ferguson of Ontario, concerned with American domination of Canadian culture, made a strong plea to Canadian businessmen to invest in the company. The response was gratifying. Among the investors was a former Canadian Prime Minister, Arthur Mahon, and the man who would soon become a Prime Minister, R.B. Bennett. To write and direct the first production, there was a big name from England, Bruce Bairn's father, the most famous cartoonist in the world. His first World War character, Old Bill, was known throughout the British Commonwealth and Empire. The film was to have a World War setting, and the heroes were to be Canadians. Bairn's father tooled up the Trenton Studios for the big production. Many of his actors and his technicians were Canadians. One of these was Gordon Sparling, a Canadian who'd been in New York learning the feature business from Walter Wanger. Sparling joined Bairn's father as an assistant director. Unfortunately, Bairn's father didn't know much about the business. He was an artist, quite a sense of humor. He was a shy, retiring sort of a man, but he uh, had a good sense of humor. He was, had the feeling that people were uh, ready to steal his comedy ideas. So it was never visible a, a script. Nobody ever had a script during the whole picture. Uh, theoretically, he had one in his pocket, but my feeling is that uh, beyond a general outline, he made it up more or less from day to day. Sparling was ordered to build a working model of the Belgian town of Ypres. He spent three months constructing an elaborate model, complete with walls and buildings that would collapse in a puff of smoke. 
The model was never used in the film, and this was typical of the production. Bairn's father's inexperience led to useless extravagances that soon pushed the costs 100% over budget. If nothing else, the film was being made in the grand manner. Everything was done on a much more elaborate scale than you could possibly do it today. For instance, the uh, big gas attack at Ypres. Uh, the 200 Pullman porters, colored boys, were brought up from Montreal and dressed up in Senegalese costumes uh, in a special train. Uh, they were fed and housed there for two or three days. The battlefield where the gas attack occurred uh, had been an old sawmill ground so that the ground was soft enough to dig trenches easily. The uh, background was up at a ruined, shelled village. Uh, today, to, to reproduce that one sequence in the film would cost probably as much as the whole film cost then. One of the extras was supposed to be a dead German, and he was getting five dollars, so they said they'd give him another five dollars if he would lie in, with his head in a puddle of water. He thought this was very nice. But the trouble was that it was bitter cold December, and uh, by the time the focusing had been done and everything rehearsed, there was ice actually forming on the puddle, and the poor fellow had to break the ice to get his head out. The film was called Carry On Sergeant, and it opened at the Regent Theater in Toronto on November 10th, 1928. were mixed. The Toronto Star was full of praise. Other critics attacked this scene between the Canadian sergeant and a French cafe girl, arguing that it should not be suggested that the Canadian soldier would engage in sexual intercourse out of wedlock, even under the most trying circumstances. The sergeant in question paid for his sin by leading a noble charge into the jaws of death. That may have saved his soul, but it didn't save the picture. Every evening, people were rushing off to the movies, but nobody was rushing off to see Carry On Sergeant. The film ran for two weeks in Toronto, and a week each in Brantford, Trenton, Kingston, and St. Catharines. That was as far as it went. The most opulent Canadian production ever made died a miserable death at the box office. The reasons are not clear. It was certainly not the seduction scenes which should have sold tickets. It is true that the talkies had just arrived, and this was a silent film, but most of the world's theaters had not yet converted to sound, and silent films were still packing people in. It was argued that it didn't show Canada in its traditional robes of ice and snow and scarlet mountie tunics, and therefore it had no international appeal. It was also argued that the Americans who owned the majority of Canadian theaters were not particularly interested in promoting a product which did not come from one of their production studios in Hollywood. Thus ended Trenton's dreams of glory. The silent film era ended on a dismal note. When sound came along, then the 
days of a man's camera were gone because you had to have all sorts of heavy equipment. You had to have a large crew. You had to shoot your uh, scenes so that the sound of the camera was masked. In the earliest days, they were using booths, which were on rollers, and you rolled them around so that the sound man could see what was being shot. The old timers uh, used to say that the fun went out of making pictures when sound came in. However, it was in Newfoundland in 1930 that a brave early attempt was made to liberate the sound film from the studio and bring it out into the natural world. A courageous young American documentary filmmaker, Varick Frizzell, raised the money for a dramatic talking picture to be shot entirely on location in Newfoundland. He would tell a dramatic story against the background of the great Newfoundland seal hunt, using a handful of professional actors mixed with hundreds of Newfoundlanders who were asked to play themselves. It was a revolutionary undertaking, and Frizzell called it the Viking. Unfortunately, the leading professional actors, Charles Starrett and Louise Huntington, were monumentally incompetent, but even they could not detract from the sheer documentary power of the film. How do you like it, boy? All right. Well, I guess we'll be getting along all right. Mary Jo wanted me to be keeping an eye out for you. You didn't bother about that, Skipper Jet. What are you trying to do, make a fool out of me in front of the men? The story concerned itself with two rivals for a lady's hand, who find themselves out seal hunting, or swiling, on the same ship. The hero has a reputation as a jinx, or jinker, which he has to live down. Look over him. Who in the devil gave you a berth on this ship? Thirty years have I been to the ice, and I've never lost a man. And now I'm swiling with a jinker. These scenes, shot in the North Atlantic, are all the more remarkable when one realizes that not one man in a hundred could swim. The villain, stricken snowblind, loses the ship, but is led back across the ice floes by his noble rival to the safety of St. John. 
This final scene was shot in the historic Quiddy Vitty Church in St. John's, but only after the clergy assured the nervous parishioners that filmmaking was not the work of the devil. him. This makes twice you've saved Luke Orem's life, Skipper Jed. Now you're wrong, my son. This time, it was Luke that saved my life. I'm one of those that called Luke Orem a jinker. But when the sight comes back to me eyes, I'll whip anyone who says Luke Orem's a jinker. <laughs> When the film was finished, Frizzell was dissatisfied with the dramatic sequences and returned in the spring to do some reshooting. While at sea, the ship exploded and 27 persons, including Frizzell, were killed. The film was released without improvements but with an introduction by the famed Sir Wilfred Grenfell. And while we must humbly bow our heads to the inscrutable will of Providence which took Varick, Frizzell and his companions from us, we may console ourselves somewhat that they first accomplished their self-appointed task. Despite the publicity, the Viking had limited success at the box office, and the company was heard from no more. If you didn't make it in the theaters, you didn't make it anywhere. In the earlier days, you only had 35 millimeter, no 16, and your only audience were the, was the theater. You couldn't, there were no film societies, no film festivals, no uh, film award shows. Uh, the only way to get your picture seen by anybody was through the theaters. Which meant that you had to make it so that it would appeal to, to the theater managers. And uh, if you didn't, you just didn't get your picture shown. And who controlled the theaters? In the early days, it was the Allen brothers, who'd come up from the States in 1906, and by 1920, owned 47 theaters across Canada. But the Allen brothers were about to meet their match. Two of the Hollywood giants, Adolf Zucker and Jesse Lasky, had embarked on a relentless campaign of theater acquisition across North America. Zucker already controlled a huge movie studio, Famous Players Lasky, and a vast distribution network, Paramount. Now he wanted movie theaters to complete an interlocking empire for the production, distribution, and exhibition of films, which would enable him to corner a good chunk of the billion dollar movie business. In 1920, Zucker moved into the rich Canadian market with the formation of Famous Players Canadian. For a time, it was ostensibly Canadian owned, but it was effectively operated by Zucker and his Canadian Lieutenant, Mr. Nate Nathanson. Famous Players went right after the Allen chain. The Allens responded with a brave expansionist policy to meet the new competition, but they were soon overextended and forced to sell out to Zucker and Nathanson. They started again, they tried to acquire whatever theaters they could, and they, they kept acquiring theaters wherever they could. And eventually they were so big that Mr. Nathanson didn't want them to be a threat to him, so he made a partnership deal with them. By 1923, famous players had 60 Canadian theaters and distribution rights from almost all the Hollywood studios. Famous player theater managers were treated royally. There were annual junkets to the Paramount lot in Hollywood to meet the stars and the starlets. Meanwhile, the independent theater owners stayed home in Canada and watched miserably 
as yet another famous player's picture palace went up across the street. A picture palace which would get the cream of the Hollywood product while the independent took the leftovers. When one Canadian independent wrote to the head of Universal Pictures, Carl Lemley, asking for the rights to one of his films, Lemley replied that even he was, as he put it, more or less at the mercy of Mr. Nathanson. Even Nathanson's friends and colleagues admitted that he operated with a singular ferocity in what was a very ruthless business. By 1929, a small group of independents were sufficiently desperate to go to war with famous players. One of them was Nat Taylor of Toronto. They didn't, uh, he didn't acquire all the theaters by any stretch of the imagination. But what he did do was acquire the important theaters in the key cities right across the country. So that it, it, if a distributor wanted to get the most money, he really had to go to famous players first because they were the source of the greatest revenue. It was 1930, and famous players now controlled 207 Canadian theaters, or approximately one quarter of all the movie houses in Canada. Their power extended far beyond that. They were in all the best locations, and they got all the best pictures, and unlimited promotion resources were available to them. Well, eventually, because we were having trouble, uh Earl Lawson managed to get Ottawa to investigate, and they eventually brought a case against certain people in the business as a combine. The Liberal Minister of Labor declined to intervene. But that year, R.B. Bennett's Conservatives were swept into power, and the new Minister of Trade and Commerce, H.H. H. Stevens, launched an investigation into the motion picture industry. Many of the independents appeared afraid to testify. Mr. Nathanson, after all, had a lot of Hollywood friends. There was enough evidence, however, to build a case. It appeared that if you build a theater, Nathanson would build one across the street. If you built near one of his existing theaters, Nathanson would make sure you didn't get very many good movies. The commission decided that a monopoly did indeed exist within the movie industry and that famous players Canadian was at the center of it. Furthermore, the system of block booking which was dictated from New York, made it virtually impossible for an independent filmmaker to get his movie shown in a Canadian theater. The Attorney General of Ontario prosecuted under the Combines Investigation Act. Famous players, its subsidiaries, and the Hollywood distributors were the defendants. Colonel John Cooper, a lobbyist for the Hollywood companies, worked hard behind the scenes. The prosecution presented its case in such a curiously half-hearted manner that the Canadian Moving Picture Digest, a trade paper, called the trial a travesty of justice. There was ample evidence that Nathanson and his boys used robber baron tactics to squeeze out the opposition, but this did not appear to be contrary to Canadian law. The Supreme Court of Ontario decided there was not sufficient evidence to convict. Thus, Hollywood retained effective control of Canadian theatres, and the only Canadian product that made its way to the screens were short films stuffed between the features which would soothe the Canadian spirit. Here comes Foster Hewitt. Hiya, Foster. Hello, Foster. Hockey broadcast. Montreal Maroons, nothing. Toronto Maple Leafs, nothing. End of the first period. Another General Motors hockey broadcast brings you Carol Lucas and his General Motors Orchestra, Ernest Dainty, and of course, Foster Hewitt. Hello, Canada, and hockey fans in the United States. Getting ready to start the second period, and there's no score. Toronto Maple Leafs, nothing. Montreal Maroons, nothing. And once again, 
in the gondola at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. And so, into the homes of more than a million Canadian listeners, where every Saturday evening you will hear the voice of Roland Baudry or Charlie Harwood or Foster Hewitt bringing news of the varying fortunes of your favorite hockey team. We did last night. Oh, wow. So another game has passed into history, with all teams racing down the stretch toward the annual playoffs for the Stanley Cup, that ancient trophy which is affectionately known all over Canada as the battered mug. Gordon Sparling, after his misadventure with Bairn's father and carry-on sergeant, had been hired on by Ben Norrish, who, if nothing else, was Canada's most durable producer. Norrish headed up Associated Screen News of Montreal which had been formed largely with CPR money in 1921. ASN had been producing travelogues and industrial shorts, but the bread and butter came from the laboratories. Almost all major Hollywood studios had their release prints made at ASN. Hollywood would not be pleased if a Canadian production house began to seriously compete with them for the rich Canadian market, and Mr. Norrish was not about to bite the hand that fed him. In an interview, Mr. Norrish declared that Canada, with its limited population, had no more use for a large moving picture studio than Hollywood had for a pulp mill. He advised Canadians not to invest their money in movies. Chubby little fellow. Couldn't see his feet for the last 15 years, I guess. But a very, uh, sort of a native shrewdness. And somebody summed it up very nicely by saying that he was a farmer. And he said, you know what good horse traders farmers are. But Norrish never put his neck out. Mr. Norrish had a firm policy. He would make some short films, but nothing so ambitious that it would threaten his American friends. Norrish liked to see his people making movies like this promotional film for the Track Tractor Company. From the mines, a snowmobile took me to a lumber camp in the bush. <laughs> that was an experience. We made about six miles an hour. It was snowing when we arrived, but the track tractors were running, and those diesel engines plowed right along. You may not know it, Dad, but the international diesel tractors have a very clever, exclusive feature. A unique arrangement converts it into a gasoline engine for starting so that it can be cranked by hand even in the coldest weather. After about a minute, it automatically switches to diesel operation. Well, I'll be done. As we were flying out, I kept thinking of those track tractor trains on their long swing over the frozen lakes and of the men driving them. Both the men and the machines are well suited to our work. I decided right then that my biggest job was to get you interested in the opportunities waiting up there. Dad, we need to expand. The North Country is the logical place. And with track tractor equipment, there's no reason why. Now, just a minute, you fellow. Don't you try to high pressure me. I don't need any convincing. Eh? I'm sold already. Oh, boy. And what's more, I'm going to make it tough for you by putting you in charge of our new Northern Division. Oh, Dad, that's great. Sparling had gone to work for Norrish on the understanding that he'd be allowed to make some short movies for the theaters, in addition to his work on industrial and promotional films. It was pretty obvious that you couldn't make pictures in Canada that would uh, pay for themselves, features that is. So when uh, I uh, talked to Norrish about the idea of theatrical shorts, that was what was in my mind. 
The budgets were very low. The subject matter was to be non-controversial. And the early product, as Gordon Sparling was the first to admit, was pretty painful. Do you remember this young lady? Ten long years ago, Doris Elizabeth Hyde of Toronto was chosen from the youngsters of the whole Dominion as Canada's loveliest child. Here she is with Colonel Cockshoot. And again with her proud father and mother. A portrait of Doris was painted by Joshua Smith, RBA, and a miniature of it was presented to Her Majesty Queen Mary to hang in her famous doll's house at Windsor Castle. A rose from the Garden of Canadian Childhood. Since then, a whole decade has rolled by. Through the mists of time, we return to 1933. A new Doris Elizabeth greets us this side of the years. Still lovely, but a child no more. Hi, Rose. You're Doris Elizabeth Hyde, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm baby Rosemary. Oh, yes, I've often heard you on the radio and seen you in the movies, too. Yes, and I've heard a lot about Canada's loveliest child. Gee, but it's awful to be famous so young, isn't it? <laughs> Let's sit down and talk about it. All right. How old are you? I'm just 14. Gee, you're way ahead of me. I was born the year you were chosen Canada's loveliest child. Can you remember those days? Well, it's a bit hazy. I was only four years old then. And after all, 10 years is a long, long time ago. Gradually, Sparling was able to overcome the minuscule budgets and his nervous producer, and his Canadian cameo series for Canadian theaters were soon of international quality. For a number of years, we were strictly instructed that no publicity should go out to uh, outside of the country. Why? Because he was very worried that the American producers would feel that here was new competition and would take uh, their business away from them and wouldn't uh, have their uh, prints made up here, which of course I think was ridiculous because I'm sure they weren't that worried about any little company up in Canada that was mm. going to cut into their their business. Sparling kept pressuring Norrish for a sound studio. There were none in Canada. It wasn't until 1936, 10 years after Al Jolson and the Warner Brothers had made the first talkie, that Sparling succeeded. And that was only because Shell Oil, a very good client of ASN, wanted to make a dramatic promotional film which couldn't be shot anywhere but on a sound stage. It was built by CPR architects and engineers who were more accustomed to building hotels. We incidentally had s sound trouble there too because of the first winter, all the, uh, uh, in the concrete, apparently a lot of crickets had been sealed in and uh, as the place got warm, they would start up there chirping and the sound man would have to go around with a broomstick banging on the floor to make them stop. 1930s, there were no more than a dozen movie directors in all of Canada. Yes, it was a small, group of people uh, working in Canada, and very few of them were working together. They were isolated uh, between each other, and then there was the great isolation from the world of filmmaking, which was mostly Hollywood in those days. It was a little bit of English influence, but so far as everybody, uh, they, they had their eye on Hollywood. And you, you were always w wishing to know how people were getting their effects or what new things were coming along or how you could do things more efficiently. And uh, you, had to, if you, you had to invent things that if you only knew, it would have saved a lot of work. Rhapsody in two languages, an impression of a day in Montreal in 1934 was a triumph of Sparling's ingenuity. The day is over.
But the night is young. It had Canada's first original music score, written by Howard Fogg, and it looked twice as expensive as it really was. Even a film like this, much more sophisticated than the American product of the time, had distribution problems. Well, then the first obstacle was that uh, the censors wouldn't uh, give their uh, approval, the Quebec censors, which meant you couldn't play in any theater in Quebec. Played up in Toronto long before it played in Montreal. And it was only after a whole lot of uh, work behind curtains was done to get it into Montreal uh, by the argument that uh, those scenes were being uh, seen uh, regularly at the nightclub just around the corner. And finally, permission was given. Well, then the next hurdle was that the theater manager of the Palace Theater was a nice place to start your run, because it was the biggest theater in Montreal. But George Rotsky, the little manager, uh, said, who cares about uh, uh, Montreal? Uh, I don't want to play it. So it was pulled out, and he ran a picture, uh, one of the Fitzpatrick travel talks, on uh, nightlife in Chicago. Everybody was going to the movies, but Canadians weren't seeing much of Canada in their movie houses. The only other Canadian content in the theaters were short clips that were stuck on to American or British newsreels. Roy Tash of Toronto was the dean of Canadian newsreel photographers. An obligatory subject for Tash and all the other newsreel men were Canada's biggest tourist attraction, the Dion Quintuplets. Yeah, <laughs> 
Well, how do you like your first birthday, eh? Don't you try and go on to Emily's cake here. Oh, she's in a candy. Oh, we're eating up the candy. Everybody's happy. Everybody's very happy. It is perhaps indicative of the state of the Canadian movie industry that only the newsreels of the Quints were shot in Canada. The famous family starred in several feature films, but they were all done in Hollywood. As a matter of fact, Canada was getting a fair bit of exposure on the movie screens of the world. Most of it was about Mounties. All of it was shot in Southern California. And very few Canadians, including the government of Canada, were the least bit concerned. After all, rent through of the Royal Mounted was very good for the tourist trade. Wonderful country, Canada. You get used to it. I told you before you couldn't get away with it, and I meant it. But no, you had ideas. You wanted to be the big shot. You double-crossed me, eh? You'd wait till we had the dough, then you'd go howling to the law. All right, I'll show you what we do with double-crossers. I'll give you something you won't forget, just like Kelly got. <laughs> and that, little boys and little girls, concludes the seventh chapter of our thrilling mystery serial, Constable Holly, sir. Sergeant Renfrew, Constable. At ease. That radio kind of fooled me. Nothing like a bit of wireless for excitement, eh? It's the only excitement that ever happens around this station. Could I get you a spot of tea? Woman who cooks for me lives just down the street. Won't take a minute. Thanks. I could stand a bite. I'll take over your post. No need, sir. Nothing ever happens here. Lightning! Lightning! Come on, get in there. I say, what's been going on here? Within my heart a temple like a peaceful love. So it must. In a somewhat more pedestrian manner, the Canadian government's Motion Picture Bureau in Ottawa was also aiming its meager production at the tourist trade. Of the 160 movies listed in the 1930 catalogue, all but 11 were tourist films, and the few other films still concentrated on fish and forests. In depression-ridden Canada, the government did not give a high priority to film. The Ontario government had disbanded its film bureau entirely and the federal government refused until 1934 to buy any sound equipment. When the Bureau finally got sound, their writers went to work with a vengeance and created some of the most incredibly florid soundtracks in the history of the documentary film. The woods re-echo with the sound of axes as the undercut is made, which fells the tree in the desired direction. And as the befoliaged monarchs crash groundward, lumberjacks at all points of the compass are busily engaged. Snap. Off she goes. It's no parlor game, this. But to the hardy lumberman, it's just another topping experience. When they dubbed it snaking, they selected a pretty apt term. The logs are no respecter of neighbors in making their forced way over piles of brother furs, very much 
as a boa constrictor bounding through the jungle, add to the sharp bark of the woodsman's axe and the crashing of trees and logs, the puffing and grunting of these valiant donkey engines. Given a convenient stream, the logs are snaked to a skidway, which shoots them into the water, bound for the mill. In 1935, the Motion Picture Bureau made a feature-length film. Using old footage, they compiled a history of the 1914-18 war. Lest We Forget was a competent film and was well received by the critics, but not many people went to see it. This little Bosnian town was early astir that fateful Sunday morning for the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary and his consort, were paying Sarajevo a royal visit. As the royal procession wended its way through the narrow streets, a Bosnian student pushing through the crowd fired two shots, killing the royal pair instantly. To the world at large, the assassination was but another episode in the tragic story of the Habsburgs. Canada was at war. From the national capital, the word sped eastward and westward through the night. From the offices and workshops of the great cities, from the surf-beaten shores of the Maritime, from the banks of the majestic St. Lawrence and its hundred affluents in the central provinces, from the shores of the Great Lakes, from the wheat fields of the West, from the fruitful slopes and broad acres of the Pacific coast, Canadians rallied to the call. No spirit of glory or conquest led them to forsake the peace of hearth and home for the privations and the sufferings of war. The royal visit of 1939 brought the Bureau out in full force, and the sequence of Their Majesty's Day in Quebec City nicely reflected those simpler and more innocent days. Three little maids in white bring tangible evidence of their affection, a floral tribute for Her Majesty the Queen, all rules of protocol, learned in hours of patient rehearsing must be observed, of course. The dots advance on their exalted mission with dignity that runs into some difficulties. Now the Queen leads the way from the platform, and the wonders of this day of days are at an end. Quebec has seen and has been conquered by the democratic graciousness of their King and Queen. Despite these few bursts of glory, the Government Bureau was not a very exciting place to work. Any attempts at creativity and innovation were generally stifled by hidebound government bureaucrats, and the product soon became stultifyingly dull and old-fashioned. The High Commissioner to London, Vincent Massey, reported that he was appalled by the lack of appeal of Canadian government films in circulation. The Bureau was headed by Captain Frank Badgley, whose spirit was gradually broken by the Ottawa bureaucracy. I remember Badgley got very low one night, he and I were talking and sipping. He said, you know, They'll give me enough money to pay all my salaries, and they won't give me any money to keep those fellows busy. He says, that doesn't make sense. I always thought of that remark. That's what he was really up against. With the result that towards the end, he got into that frame of mind. Well, I don't care. Let them pay me, and if that's what they're, they want. And they're a good man, but it didn't have the uh, fire that it needed, partly because the government wouldn't let them do anything. It all had to fit within a pattern. The sun shone more brightly on Victoria, B.C. During the 1930s, this little city was the unlikely movie capital of the North. 
The British government had recently established a quota system. Under it, a Hollywood producer who wanted to show his films in the United Kingdom had to make a certain proportion of them in the British Commonwealth. Victoria was the closest Commonwealth city to California, and so Hollywood set up a branch plant to satisfy the British requirements. They built a studio in the horse barns at Victoria's exhibition grounds and proceeded to grind out some very cheap films, which soon became known as the Quota Quickies. Such was Secrets of Chinatown. You have come to me in a worthy cause. Except for that, these doors would never have opened before you. You seek to save life to bring an end to those who would ravish mankind. As you see, it's a mountain on the west coast of Vancouver Island. It's a lonely, godforsaken spot used by the Indians as a hunting ground. I haven't the least doubt that that's the place we're looking for. Well, we'll rout them out this time, Don. Mm, it'll need more subtlety than that, I'm afraid. They have guards. They disappear long before ever you got near the mountain. No. My idea is this. We pack across Vancouver Island and approach false ears from the rear. There, I'll contact Rand. We've got to save that lad. And the girl, too. You shall watch your lover start his journey. Thank you, Zeke. See, she shall be sheeted white. Chantal Ling! I shall be the last person your eyes shall look upon. Chantal Ling, you're under arrest. I regret, Mr. Commissioner, I must disappoint you. I go in my own way alone. This is deadly poison. I shall be dead in a few minutes. And Mr. Commissioner, if I have made you look rather foolish, pray accept my apologies. Mr. Dawn, you are a brilliant man. I admire you and I honor you. Gentlemen of the police, you have been very kind. I regret I must cheat you. The negative of this particular film was seized by the sheriff for payment of debts. And Bishop quietly disappeared. He soon resurfaced, however, and once again set up shop in the horse barns of Victoria. He established a new company and churned out about a dozen quota quickies for the British market between 1935 and 1938. They had such titles as Tugboat Princess, Death Goes North, Manhattan Shakedown. A few of the smaller parts were played by local talent, but the leading roles were taken by B-picture actors from Hollywood. Their last film, The Convicted, featured a Hollywood starlet by the name of Rita Hayworth. Maggie went out a few minutes ago. Uh, do you know when she'll be back? She ain't far, just shopping across the street. In that store. There she is, look. Don't get her. murdered as sure as I'm born to shut her mouth. Can't you see? First of all, she was bribed. And then as soon as the trial is safely over, she's put out of the way for good. Yeah, it begins to smell like rain. There's somebody big behind all this, somebody with plenty of influence and money. And what are you going to do about it? I don't know yet, but whoever this somebody is, with Aggie dead and Baker gone, he's completely covered up his tracks. <laughs> 
films from the Victoria horse barns were being shown in British theaters because they had to show a certain percentage of Commonwealth movies. They were being shown, however, in the mornings to charwomen, with American movies being run for the paying customers in the afternoons and evenings. The quota system had been established so that Britain and her Commonwealth would have a movie industry of their own and not be totally overwhelmed by Hollywood. The now infamous quota quickies made by a branch plant of a Hollywood studio rather defeated that purpose. In the British House of Lords, the Canadians were specifically denounced for permitting flagrant abuses of the system. A somewhat disgusted British government decided it would no longer accept movies made in the Commonwealth as part of the quota. The horse barns of Victoria were restored to their rightful occupants. The Trenton Studios had already been converted to a dry cleaning plant. Some Canadians undoubtedly felt that both buildings now served more useful purposes. But there were the others who still believed in dreams. There was a man named Booth, J.R. Booth, a little chap who uh, promoted uh, a feature which he made in segments over a long period of time, every time he got a little bit of money. And they used all sorts of places for their location shots. I remember hearing about using the boiler room at Eaton's to represent the sewers of Paris or something. And he uh, gradually got very grandiloquent ideas. He was going to build a studio city and he had a big roll of blueprints that he carried around with him. Unfortunately, though, I saw the blueprints. It must have been gotten from some construction company because they were for a bank and a store. But these uh, represented the great studio that he hoped someday to build. Whatever happened to him, I don't know, but it, it was interesting the way he worked for his idea, his goal. The pioneers in Dreamland. Gordon Sparling, Roy Tash, Frank Badgley, Bill Oliver, Jack Chisholm, a very small company of men. The Second World War was about to break out, and Canada, with the establishment of the National Film Board and a new group of small private companies, was about to become one of the most prolific and respected makers of documentary film in the world. But in 1939, the movie industry in Canada was a wasteland, inhabited by but a very few brave and lonely souls. And I remember uh, Cowboy Keen. The poor fellow had very little money, and he would make a uh, little money one way and another, and then make another scene of the, of the film. And that went on for years. I don't know whether he ever did get the picture finished, but it was certainly a good example of Somebody with a burning light ahead of him trying to accomplish something. In many respects, a bleak and somewhat shabby world, beset by cheap politicians, pompous bureaucrats, and greedy promoters, and by an indifferent Canadian public who seemed more interested in watching Shirley Temple than they were in watching themselves all of which lent a certain nobility to those few Canadian movie people who endured and refused to surrender the dream. <laughs>